them together. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And uh, welcome to another uh, portion, another beautiful portion, the portion of uh, Yitro. What a, what, a, what a week this Pasha is. This is the week. If they're going through uh, 210 years of slavery, we are now in the portion. We have marched out of slavery, Baruch Hashem. And we are now in the desert. You have to feel like you're, you're living the portion. We're in the desert and we are now, after um, 50 days from going out of Mitzrayim, we are now ready to receive the Torah, Matan Torah, which is the whole reason why we went as Jews through the whole slavery and everything else, is all to be able to receive the Torah. What a wonderful and beautiful Pasha it's going to be. Where am I? I'm in the ocean. So uh, <laughs> it's your imagination where I am. So I'm in Florida. I'm right. I'm, I'm, I'm here. Don't worry. I'm not anywhere special. <laughs> I'm just in a room that's a little bit messy. So I uh, I put a, I put up a background. That's the uh, capability of Zoom. Okay, my friends. So. This Pasha is called, but the, the, this Pasha, as I said, is the giving of the Torah, but it's called Pasha's Yitro. What an honor that the Torah gives Yitro, this unbelievable honor to call the portion after him, the portion is the giving of the Torah. He is the father in law of, of, of Moshe Rabbeinu. But why would the Torah give such an unbelievable honor to this, to this man? Not only the Torah gives such an unbelievable honor by calling the whole portion the portion of Yitro, but actually the Torah begins with Yitro, even though, according to most commentators, Yitro actually came to, 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 to Moses and the deserts after the giving of the Torah. So the Torah not only calls the portion after his name, the Torah doesn't go in chronological order. It puts Yitro before the giving of the Torah, even though it's been proven that actually Yitro, the father of Moses, came to the desert after the giving of the Torah. So why? Why would the Torah put Yitro, why would the Torah for the honor of Yitro to go out of chronological order and go to tell us about Yitro? There must be a reason. This cannot be just something that is just there. And therefore, this is a sikh of the Rebbe that we're going to learn tonight. It's a uh, beautiful interpretation of the Rebbe, one of his talks and his writings, that he uh, tells us why Yitro is important for us to learn about before the giving of the Torah. Because really, Yitro, in essence, has within it the whole reason or the whole, the whole way to receive the Torah, Yitro. Yitro is going to teach us how do we receive the Torah. Every day in the morning, we wake up in the morning, we make a bracha, Baruch Atah Hashem, they say in our Torah, bless you God, to give it a Torah, means that every day we have an obligation to receive the Torah, and we make a bracha of, on the receiving of the Torah, and we learn the Torah, well, that that we learn Torah is the, is the receiving of the Torah today, whether we learned in the morning or learning now Torah, it's all receiving the Torah. We're doing a mitzvah. Every day we should do the mitzvah. The Torah says you should learn the Torah by day and by night. So every day you have to learn some Torah in the morning, in the morning and some Torah at night. So learning is one thing and receiving is a total different concept. And to be able to receive the Torah, to be able to not only to learn, learning never ends, but to be able to receive the Torah, we have to have certain concepts that Rebbe is going to explain that gives us the capability to receive the Torah. It's a very fascinating sikha. This class is called Lift Your Hands Above Your Head, which is an which is important uh, statement to the whole class. And the Rebbe is going to explain why our hands go above our heads. There is a reason why our hands, David created a body, and he created that our hands 
go above our heads, Baruch Hashem. Those who can take their hands and reach it to pick it up, to pick up their hands above their head and try to stretch out as much as you can, right? You always can feel like you can reach more. You can reach more. Why? Why did it? Why did? Why did the God create this concept of a body and your hands to reach reach higher than yourself? And there's an important lesson. Actually, if you've been listening to the classes in general, Exodus and the and the uh, the if you were on the um, the Tu B'Shvat, everything is divided into four parts. The world, the world is created with four uh, levels, and there's four worlds. The world of emanation, the world of creation, the world of, of formation, the world of action. And in real and truth, there's three worlds. And then there's a fourth world, which is above and beyond, which is the world of Attilus, the world of emanation, is truly above and beyond even the world of creation and formation and action. So we have the fourth world, which is going to be symbolic to our hands. As you'll see, the beautiful Sikha with the Rebbe is going to talk to us. You have any questions? You may open, you may ask. The class starts off if you have the book. It's in text number one. It's on page 65 in your, in your book. If you don't have the book, you can go to the book of Exodus, chapter 18, verse number one. That's what we're going to start. So this is the first verse in the Torah, this week's portion. By Yishma Yisle, now Moses' father-in-law, Jethro the Kayin of Midian heard. He heard. This was uh, news. The whole story about the Jews going out of Egypt was national news. Jews were in the, in the, in the front paper, not to not start today. There were always front news. And everybody heard about what's happening to the Jewish people, the whole world. God, what God has done to Moses for Israel, his people, and that God has taken them out of the lands of, e of Egypt. Now, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, and, and his, Moses' son and his wife came to Moses. So Yisro took his, his daughter, Tipora, with her two children, and he brought her to the desert. Moses told his father-in-law all that God had done to Pharaoh and to Egypt and to the Egyptians and accounted the Israel of the Jews. But all the hardship that had fallen them on their way, and that God has saved them. And Yisrael was happy about all the good that God had done to Israel, that he rescued them from the hands of the Egyptians. Thereupon, yes, Yisrael said, Blessed is God. This is, a, <coughs> this is the first time we see the expression concerning the going out of Egypt. Baruch Hashem. Yet Yisrael is the first one that, that makes the bracha. The blessing, Jewish people sang, but Yisrael is the first one that says, Baruch Hashem, he makes the blessing to thank God on, the, on, on somebody who's saved from a catastrophe, who was rested for the hands of the Egyptians, for the hands of Pharaoh, who was rested the people beneath the hands of the Egyptians. So here, Yisrael is, he's, he's happy. He's really excited, so happy. That he has come down to, 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 to the desert. Yisra, he was living in Midian. He's not only living in Midian, he's a Koyin in Midian, he's a high priest, he's a minister, he's a big knake. He decides to uproot himself and come to the desert. And he says the famous statement of the Pasuk it says, Now I know that God is great in all deities. With for with the things that he has plotted, he came upon them. So he, Yisrael, here Rashi says that we know that Yisrael was a uh, theologian, a, 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 a professor of all religions of that time. And he knew every aspect of godliness or whatever, whatever Meshugas that was, uh, that was being taught in his time. And he would know more. And he said, now I know. It took him time. Then Moses' father and Jesto sacrificed a burnt offering, a priest offering to God. And Aaron, the eldest, came to die with the Moses' father-in-law before God. This is the, uh, so this is, the, uh, this is, the, this is the, uh, the story. This is the basic, the beginning of the Torah. 
this is and and that's why the parsha is called Yisro. So let's put the picture. Let's try to create a picture so you'll understand of who Yisro was. So in text number two, in page sixty-six, Koyin Midyan, the our sages take apart the verse and say what is the meaning that Yisro was Koyin Midyan? He was a priest in Midyan. Rabbi Shua Aimer, Koyimer, he was a priest. Rabbi Leza said he was a minister. So either he, in those days, a priest was like, uh, had all the power. Like in Egypt. So the priests were like the, uh, stronger than, than, the, than the kings. Or he was a minister. Either way, either way, we're talking about somebody who was pretty high up there. Pretty influential. We know also that the Medrash says he doesn't look down over here. The Medrash says he was one of the advisors of the Pharaoh. This was a powerful individual, a very powerful man who, um, who was, became the father in law of Meshla Beno. Didn't go through what the Jews went through in Egypt. He was not a non Jewish person. And ultimately came down to the desert. And the Torah starts off by Yishma Yisrael. The Torah, in essence, wants to talk about the greatness of Yisrael that Yisrael heard by Yishma Yisrael. That's the first two verses in this week's Pasha. By Yishma Yisrael. And like the Torah is impressed that, you know what? Yisrael heard. I wouldn't accept, I, I, not so important that the, anybody else heard by Yishma Yisrael. That Yisrael heard. Yisrael, the, 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 this big minister, this big, this, big, uh, this big priest, he heard. Torah wants to impress upon us this concept that we should realize who Yisrael was, to realize that if Yisrael heard, if you know who Yisrael was and he heard, then you know that it was something to hear, so to say. There was something powerful to be heard. Rashi says, Yisroi, what's his name? What's his real name? Yisroi. So Rashi says, Yisroi was called by seven names. Yisroi in the Torah has seven names. The joke is that Yisroi had seven daughters. So to marry them off, he ba went bankrupt seven times. That's why he had to change his name. That's the joke. But uh, Rashi doesn't say that. <laughs> Rashi says Yisrael has seven names. He has his name in the Torah is Ruel, Yese, Yisrael, Chayve, Chaver, Haini, Kutia. Yisrael had seven names. Why was he called all these names? And Rashi goes through a few of them. He says Yisrael. He, why is it called Yesa? Yesa means to add, because in this week's portion, the Torah adds a whole law in his honor. That's how much the Torah wants to be, is impressed with Yesa. The Torah is impressed that Yesa heard and he came and then he asked Maishra Abena to do something in, judu, in judicial law to create, to create uh, uh, courts and and different levels of, 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 of rabbis, questions and answers, and the Torah adds it to the, to the Torah adds a whole portion because of Yisrael. So he was called Yesed because of that. Why was he called Yisrael? We're adding a Yud at the end of the word. This, when he converted to fulfill the commandments, the letter was added to his name. Yisro Yud, the name of God. So we added a Yud in this week's portion, Yisro. Why was he we added a Yud? Because he came down, he accepted upon himself. The Yevishta, he accepted himself as oh God. Which is again, something, if you know who Yisro is, then you would know that he would do, that. He, why would he do such a thing? Chayvav, why was he called Chayvav? Chayvav means one who loves, a lover. 
because he loved the Torah. The Yisrael loved the law. And as Rashi says, we know that he was called Chayvav because later in the, in, in the book, in the Chronicles, the book in, the, in, in, in Tanakh, you see it says the children of Chayvav, the Moses father-in-law. And so too the others' names that he had. Putiel is going to come up later. The name Putiel will come up later in the story of Pinchas. Why he was called Putiel. Ru'el. All the names of God, God, all his names had something to do with some aspect of, of his journey to godliness. In his journey to Yiddishkeit. Y- y- Yisrael took a journey to the Torah. Really, that gives you already the answer of what was so special about Yisrael. Yisrael took a journey to the Torah. By him, this was a journey. By the Jews in, 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 in coming out of Egypt, we know that God forced upon them the Torah. Yisrael was his own personal journey. He didn't have to come. He would have anyway been given honor by the Jewish people. He was the father-in-law of Moses, whether he was going to become a Jew or not a Jew. He was the father-in-law of Moses, which was already a great honor. It's not about that. It's his personal journey. That's why the Torah, that's why Rashi says that, it, that he was given seven names. Not because, only because of his connection and his relationship with Moshe Rabbeinu, but his own personal journey. So therefore, even though the Torah was given on Mount Sinai, and as we know, the Medrash says that God took the mountain over the Jewish nation, the Torah starts over the story of Yisrael because it's really now a personal journey that each and every one of us needs to take. We all need to take a journey. As you will see, as you will see, Dashi says, by Yishma Yisrael. It's your personal journey. The Jewish people, the Torah was given by God, whether you like it or not. But then the Torah wants that every person should have that personal journey. What you, what rang your, 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 what, what pushed your soul? What touched my neshama to, to do what I'm doing? Or is it does basically, that's the way I was born. Some people can have that concept. We were born this way. I'm, 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 I'm religious. I'm, I'm from, because that's where I was born. That's the expression, FFB, from, from birth. Like a stigma. So you're, for, you're, you're born that way. What are you going to do about it? No. It's a personal journey. By Yishma Yishrei. Really the question is to all of us. Yisrael, what is our love to the Torah? What is our love? Because we want to receive the Torah, which we're going to receive this week. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to read it in this week's portion. So we're going to receive the Torah this week. What is our journey? Are we just going to receive the Torah because that's the week? It's the portion of Yisrael. And Yisrael is the week that we receive the Torah, or, it's the, or is it a portion that is something that's our own? personal journey like Yisrael. So therefore, the Rebbe says, really, you'll realize that none of us had a journey of Yisrael. Yisrael went from a 180 degree journey. He went from one side to the other side. He really had a journey. And the Rebbe brings down another message to emphasize this. Azoya in text number four. Jethro was the was the greatest of the, the Zoharites. Jethro was the greatest of all pagan priests. Arrived and swore fearfully to God, stating, "Now I know that God is great in all deities." Because Jethro knew all deities, and he was very involved in all deities. He was a kohen of of deities. So he knew exactly what it meant. He comprehended what it meant. And he serviced them. 
That's why one of his negative names was Putiel, Rashi tells later, that he fat that the, that the tribes called him Putiel, that he fattened Puti, that he Puti is terms of fat, that he fattened the calves for idol worship, for idol worshipers. And that's who he's called Putiel, Putiel. And at that moment, God's glory was, re, was resplendent in the, both in the greater heights and the lower realms. The Torah wants to emphasize that, 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 that the lowest realms of the world, the opposite of godliness, the second commandment, you shall not have any other gods. That was, that was Yisrael. Yisrael had many gods. He not only had many gods, he serviced many gods. He was the one who represented them to the people. And he came, came, made, a, made a U-turn. If he can make a U-turn, all of us can make this U-turn. We just have to be wanting to make the U-turn. Because the Torah wants to make a paradigm shift in thought. Matan Torah, meaning people are people are, are taking the whole concept of Matan Torah as some kind of a, you know, uh, you know, theatrical phenomenon. God wanted to impress upon Himself in the Jewish nation, and He had to come down with theatrics and you know, fire show and uh, you know, booming acts. Uh, you know, you have to you have to show Himself that He's. That he's that he has that he, that he can give commandments. So he had to come out like a, you know a king. I have the level of dollars like a king has to come out with all his glory. God had to come out with all his glory. So we're taking Martin Taylor wrong. Martin Taylor is really a U-turn for humanity and especially to the Jewish nation from that time and all times to make a U-turn to think, as we're going to say right now, to think out of the box. The Abishta God wanted that people should think out of the box. And that's really the revelation of Martin Taylor. That God said, I created the world. I created the boundaries in the world. I was the one who created this world. So I know the boundaries in the world. But I want you as a nation to think out of this box. And that takes a whole shift. That takes a shift in thought. That's not simple. That's easier said than done. So to do what is right, to do a mitzvah, that's easy. But, but what the mitzvah wanted to accomplish, that you should think out of the box, that is much more difficult. And that is the way the Rebbe Chassidus explains Matan Torah. Matan Torah was a change in thought that God wanted that people should think differently. The truth is, even the Jews felt didn't get it right away. We know that 40 days later, they made a golden calf. So it was not an easy thing. That's why Martin Taylor was not so easy. Oh, God said not to make an idol. They made an idol. What are they, stupid? Then they're stupid. No, these were not stupid people. God wanted that the Jewish people should start thinking different. And that's what he really wants from every one of us. And that's why God gives a Torah every day. Because every day he wants, we should think different. Think out of the box. You can think in the box. I'm asking you to think out of the box. And that's the truth is why there's a mitzvah to learn Torah every morning. Because you're, a whole day you're going to be thinking in the box. A whole day you're going to be working in the world, whatever your job might be. Or if you don't have a job, whatever your relaxation, wherever you're going to be, you're only thinking in the box. You're thinking the way it's been situated, the way, it, the way it's established, the way things got to be. And then God says, no, I don't want that only. Okay, you have to think in the box some things, but I want a Jew to think out of the box. I want to give the Jew the capability to realize 
that in that even though I'm asking you to think in the box, I'm not asking you to break realities. I'm asking you also to think out of the box. So what is the box? What is a box? What is the box? We have to understand what about the box is. What is my box? And how do I think out of the box? So the Rebbe goes into this concept in Jewish law. What is, because even in Jewish law, we have the concept of a box. And what is called in Jewish law, it's called the place, space of a human being. What is my space? What is my box? So in text number five, here you have the general rule of what is my box and what's your box. And this, this is important in Jewish law, as you'll soon see. It's not so, it's not so, it's just a concept in law. What is your space? So you, Adam, four Amis by four Amis surrounding a person are considered his personal space. The question is, what is an Amma? An Amma is a, is a Torah measurement. And I can tell you, it fluctuates between 1.57, 1.57 feet and 2.1 feet. So if it's 1.57, so four Amis is 6.28 feet. Six point two eight feet on all sides. So if I'm standing in one place, I have 6.28 feet around me. That is my space. That's the, that is one height. I'm like shorter than that. I'm 5.4. <laughs> That's why I'm a shorty, because I am, if you go 1.57, that's the normal height, total height of a normal person is 6.28. But if you go, the highest number of Amma is actually 2.1, 2.1 feet. So then four Amas would be 8.4 feet. So then I'm really short. So, um, right. So that's a normal size. Take it, take, this is the normal. We're not going to, the, 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 the Allah couldn't go each person to his height. That's a normal height, 6.28 feet. If you were to go the lowest to 8.4 feet. And this is, this, is, this is important in Jewish law, this concept of what is your space. And, 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 what, and in practical, what does it make a difference in practicality? So he brings down, the Rebbe brings down a Rambam and Manarim. Text number six, a per, we know in Jewish law, a person's culture can acquire property for him without being aware of it. If you if you're, if you're, if you have a, you have like a house, let's say, and you have a front lawn that has a gated, the, the, especially that's gated, if somebody throws something into that lawn, it's yours. It becomes yours. Thus, if a lost object falls to the person's courtyard, he acquires it. His chotzer acquires it. Similarly, the air within the radius of four cubics next to the place where the person is standing can acquire property for him like his own courtyard. So in Allah, if I'm standing still, that's my space. Four Amas by four Amas by four Amas by four Amas. On all directions. I would say to ordain this, this convention so that people will discover most of it should not come to strife when this, when this convention employed in all alleyways or in the sides of public, uh, when is this convention employed? It's not if you're standing on Lions Road. It's in alleyways on the side of the public domain, which are not crowded with many people or in a field that is odorless 
whenever a person stands in the public domain or in a field belonging to a colleague, the area within the radius of Bill Kibbe cannot acquire property on his behalf, self in the state. In such places, he cannot acquire lost articles until he reaches with his hand the infection thing. So, but in a situation where, 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 where a person can acquire his property, and then I, and you see, so look at the next text before we continue. It says, the four armies surround, you don't get, I don't know why we're going so much into this law. So he continues that the four armies surrounding a person function as a Kenyan does not have scriptural roots. Nevertheless, there's so much as the round base attracted that these four armies acquire, acquire ob objects using the power of the courts to size property. The round base transfer only fit to the actual space to a person standing besides it like a hut. So the rabbis, whether it's a binnacle Torah, for example, again, how practical is this? We don't, we, we don't do this anymore. The next law, we don't do this today. We don't throw a, a, a divorce into somebody's hands. It's brought to a court. But in, but in text number eight, he brings out another law of Maimonides and divorce. The following rule applies to if a woman holds out her hand at an incline and her husband throws the get in her hand and it falls to the earth. If it falls within four amas of where she's standing, and comes to rest it, the divorce is effective because it's in her four cubits. So too, in the law of Shabbos, we mentioned last week when we learned, we learned the law of Shabbos, Tchum Shabbos. So too, you're not allowed to carry on, in, in, in public domain on Shabbos. You're not allowed to carry in a public domain, right? So what happens? If I'm walking down the street and suddenly I feel there's no air, I suddenly feel that I have something in my pocket. So the lawyers, text number nine, one who fell asleep while traveling didn't realize a Shabbos, so he woke up at Shabbos. He's not allowed to travel further than four Amis. He's not allowed to go past four Amis. He's not allowed to carry more than four Amis. So the four Amis is still his. So in essence, the four Amis, the whatever the six feet or the eight feet, is still in my, my, my domain. So it's not the public domain. But over the six feet or, or the eight feet, that will be considered the public domain. So I wouldn't let it carry six to eight feet. So really in Jewish law, if I'm carrying something, I can carry for, for five feet, stop. Carry for five feet, stop. Carry for five feet, stop. Carry for five feet stopped. Carry for five feet stopped. And I wouldn't have been done the, the prohibition of carrying because I would walk five feet, come my private domain, walk another five feet, walk another five feet. I wouldn't advise to do that because you have to really know where your five feet is. So if you, uh, unless you're walking with a tape measure, you have to know how where your, your, your six uh, or eight feet end. But one step over that eight foot, or that six point whatever, you're going to be walking into a public, public domain. So that's the problem. The best thing would be on Shabbos, if you're carrying something out of, out of a thing, is to walk, if you can find within the five to six feet, someplace to put, hide your keys. Under a tree, under, uh, under some place where you can hide it, so you can walk to the five, four, four the six feet, and hide your keys, and then you, get, you have no problem. That will be that we still again. So you see, in the law of Shabbos, you have this concept. Now I don't know how you do the next concept because it's very most shul, uh, today you can do this because most shuls are separate seating and 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 and, and everybody's far away from each other due to uh, COVID. But in Jewish law, text number ten, Rabbi Yosekar and Shulchan Aruch, one must not sit within four Amis of a person immersed in prayer. That means really synagogues need to be that one should be away from each other by six feet. Look at that. That is the law. That's the, <laughs> that's the COVID restriction. Six to 10 feet. <laughs> so really, <laughs> but it's not practical this in, in, in a show. 
Because you'll have to have if you bump your shoulders. Everybody's gonna have six feet. Everybody's gonna have six feet around him. It will be pretty, uh, pretty big show you need. But really, that's what Salacha says. Whether in front or in back or the side, so you need six feet. Everybody needs to be six feet away from each other. One must distance oneself for Amis. Likewise, one must not pass within four Amis in front of a person immersed in prayer. When somebody's diving Shemun Esser, you really should not walk in front of him. You can walk in front of him if you're six feet away from him. Six to eight feet away from him. This restriction is limited to the front of the prey of the person alone, but not to not walking in back of him. But if you if the guys, the person in the middle, the person's in the middle Shmanessa, you shouldn't walk in front of him. You shouldn't pass in front of him unless you're six feet away from him. So that's his space. That's in essence his space. If a person is davening and he needs to, if he's immersed in prayer, if you're going to walk in front of him, you lose his concentration. So therefore, you're not allowed to really walk in front of him. That's his space. So this is very interesting in Jewish law. And look at the next text, text 11, also very interesting. What is the scriptural source for the four Amis within which a person is always permitted to walk on Shabbos? Again, where do we, where do we get the, the, the root for Amis? How do we know for Amis? Everything has to be connected to something in the Torah. So where do the rabbis come up with four cubit feet? Which is again, four cubits is in, the, in, in feet, it's like six again, six or eight, whatever it fluctuates. It depends on how, how do you hold Amis and Amis. So, it's, so how do we know that? So it's taught the verse states, Shuvu, it is last week's class. Shuvu ish tachtav. When the Jews, when the God, when Moses warned the Jews not to go out to collect the man on Shabbos, he told them each person should sit, remain man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So we learned about Chum Shabbos. But if you just take the, the, the simple, the, 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 the verse of the Torah, it says, don't tachta from under him. Don't move from your physical space. How much is the area of his place? That's what the Gemara says. So not only we learned Tum Shabbos, there's 2,000 Amis that we, we spoke about last week, but actually the Torah over here wants to teach us another law. And that is what is the space of a person? Of a person? What is the meaning don't move from your space? What's your space? What is considered your space? A body typical measures three amas. So you take from the head to the feet. The Gemara says a body is usually three amas. From the head to the feet, three amas. If the smallest number, 1.57, then three amas is 4.71, which means from my head, and actually that's truth. I'm not saying I'm not so short. Because really, it's three amis. Three amis is, 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 is really the height of a person. From his head. You don't, you don't measure a person from his hands. You measure from his head. From the head to his feet, it's actually three amis. Which then the number comes down. So then if it's 1.57, it's four feet, 7.71. And if it's 2.1, it's six feet, 0.3. So if it's 2.1, I'm still short. And if it's if it's three, uh, if it's if it's 1.57, then I am I'm taller on 5.4. So so really it's from the head to the to the to the to, to the to the to the to the feet. And that's three arms. So you see, look what, look what he says further. And how many a body typically measures three arms, an additional armor. Now we go to the hands. An additional arm allows him to spread his hands and feet. This is my this is my four arms. Picking up my hands. That's where I got the four arms. If I put my hands down, it's three arms. 
I pick my hands up, it's four amas. That's my fourth amma. So really, it's three. A regular person is three. And he needs to pick up his hands to make it four. So therefore, if you take a body, you lay it down, on a, on, you lay it down not standing, you lay him down, it's three amas. That's the space of a person, head, head to, 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 to foot. Now he, we want to give him to stretch his hand out this way or his hand out that way. Either way, the only thing, or the feet, I could stretch out that way a lot, as much as possible. But for sure, my hands can go all the way up this way and can go that, that way. And that's where you have your four amas. This is a statement of Ramea. Have you just said a person's body measures three amas? An additional amas is needed to, in order to allow it to pick up an object from under his feet and place it on his head. So again, the Abish, the, God created the hands to be able to take something from the bottom and put it on top. That's why I need the fourth armor. The fourth armor is my hands to reach up, lift up your hands above your head. Either way, whether you're a man or other, the concept of the fourth armor is your hands, the capability of your hands reaching above his head. So now the Rebbe takes this concept and he flies with it, so to say. He goes with it and he gives us an unbelievable teaching. There's really three armors, the body, and then there's the fourth armor, reaching up your hands above your head. And that's text number 12. So if you have the book, Beautiful. This is the, 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 the essence of the Sikha. If you don't have the book, just listen in to me. So the Rebbe said this following word. Naturally, a person takes, takes up a space of three Amis. That's what the Gemara says. Correspond to the three umbrella parts, um, uh, uh, umbrella parts of the body. Namely, the head, the torso, and the legs. According to the rule of creation, the head is loftier part of the person. Then the torso. Finally, the lowest part is legs. So in essence, you take the person, you divide it into three parts, his head, his body, and his legs. In this scheme, the hands, which extend above both sides of the torso, are lower than his head, right? The, the hands of body, the, the, the hands of, are part of my body. They're not part of my head. My head is, is separate. But my hands are part of my body, but it gives me the capability to reach higher. They to gave my hands the capability to go higher. Everything is connected to Torah. And the Rebbe explains it. And it is in each person's task to reach beyond the three Amis. That's why God, God says, really, your space is three Amis. The proof is I put your hands Part of your torso, but your head is you, and you're in the three. So your hands are really in the three armors. Your hands are part of your torso. It's underneath your head. But I've given you the capability, your hands, to go up more than three armors. I've given you your hands the capability to go higher, to reach beyond the peak of what a human can naturally achieve. That's the lesson. Namely, beyond the head, the seat of reason. Maybe he says, I'm putting within your torso, which is lower than your head. I'm going to show you that you have the capability to go higher than your head. You talk ahead, you talk is smart, you talk and comprehend everything. I want you to go out of the box. I want you to think out of the box. Even though I gave you a head, and that head understands everything, and I want you to understand anything, everything. I want you to put everything in the box. But don't forget, I gave you a hand that you should go higher. And you know what happens if you, if you go higher than your head? You have now received another ama. You have now received another ama to your space. So not that you might think, oh, but my space might get smaller. Actually, by going above your head, your space is going to become bigger. Think out of the box, and your box will get bigger. That's what the Rebbe says with the lesson. If 
by thinking out of the box doesn't make the box smaller, makes the box bigger. Because once I think out of the box, I have the capability to make this box bigger. By reaching, if I would lay down on the ground, not to pick up my hands, my box would be three amas. By reaching and picking up my hands, I've now broken the box. I've actually extended the box to be four amas, to be four cubits. In other words, a person should use his or her reason. And instead of getting stuck in the parameters of the, of the very power of reason, break free and engage in matters that are beyond what is in the head, can reach it on its own. Go think beyond the box. The Rebbe, the Lubavitch Rebbe, if you learn his sikhs, and you listen to him, he did exactly that. He always thought out of the box. He never ever, he always went and reached higher and got out of the box. He changed the way to look at, at everything in the Torah. Russia took the Torah and gave it a whole beautiful new dimension, truly and honestly. And that, that is the capability to think out of the box, to make the box bigger, to make my life bigger. Don't be so small that we shouldn't be small minded. We should realize that, it, with, that within my capable of reason, I have the capacity to go greater. We see that in life people that think out of the box, people that go beyond their capability, show what they're really capable of. Most of us are stuck in our little worlds and we're afraid to be to go beyond our capacity. I think just the opposite. Maybe if I go beyond my capacity, I actually show that I have that capacity. I have that capability. And also at this present time, I think I'm not capable. So I have to go do the irrational to show that it's actually very rational. The Amish to want it, God wanted. Not to change the rational, to make it bigger, to make the rational bigger. So things that are basically in the box, basic laws have within them much deeper concepts. Don't just take the basic laws and just follow just the you know what says you know what you know what's in the in, in, in the law. That's a problem. Sometimes even in law, we get stuck in the basic parameters, or we can't think above it. That's a matter, that's a problem with American law. And the legal system that we live in today. They're so into the, into the, into the, into, you know, following what has been, was written, that they don't get the, the essence of the law. What is, what is the real purpose of this law? Maybe if you understand the purpose of the law, you'll change the way the law was written. But we're stuck in the box. We're stuck in the box. And we, you know, we're, we're, in many aspects, it hurts people being stuck in the box. The Abish to wanted, God wanted that the Torah will give a person the cap not only the, the, the capability to, to reach above himself, to go higher than himself, and to realize that actually it's all there to begin with. His hand was always there to begin with. It was not something that was something new. So that's why most of us, when we, we're afraid of the unknown, but really nothing is unknown. It's always there to begin with. I'm just afraid of to bring it out, that concept. So let's look at the words of the Zohar. Text number 13 brings out the words of the Zohar. The Zohar says as follows. Come and look. What a person wears is visible to all. And only the foolish will look at a person with a night clothing and not look further. We'll only look at the exterior people. The Zohar says this 2,000 years ago. We're always looking at the exterior of things. Nobody's ever looking at the essence of anything. It's so all the way it's packaged. It's so all the way we see it. The body and its clothing are a metaphor for the body and soul. We have the body. Everything is. The body and the clothing. So in, in aspect of cities, everything can be. The body is like a metaphor of, of clothing for the soul. Clothing is a metaphor to the clothing of the body, which is the real soul of the person. When well, you look at the person's clothing, you got to look at the person. 
The Torah has a body, namely the mitzvahs, which are the very dressed up in the realm of in our world, like a body in clothing. What is the true aspect of the mitzvah? What is the body? What is the soul of this mitzvah? What is the, what is the body of this person? Don't look at the clothing, which we all look, all look at. And we decide, when we look at the person's clothing, we decide what kind of person he is, or what not kind of person he is. Everything is an outer expression. Mishnah said, Don't look at the vessel, but what's in the vessel. It's more important what's in the vessel than the vessel. You can have a beautiful vessel, vessel that has nothing good in it, and you can have not such a good vessel that has unbelievable wine in it. But we're stuck in the box. Therefore, we say in the Shema, don't be misguided with what you see. It's very hard. This is very difficult for a person not to be judgmental and misguided of what he sees. He falls into the realms of what he sees. And it affects him extremely hard. But Abish just that's what God asks you. Think out of the box. Think out of think, don't, don't look what you see. Can you see deeper? And I gave you the Torah. For that reason, to not just look at what you see, but look a little bit deeper. This was this was able to change the world. So don't kill, don't steal. Not only because, oh, that is that is that's not a, that's not a good thing to do. What happens if you decide it is a good thing to do? What happens if you decide that this is the this is a positive thing to do? You have to go a little deeper why you shouldn't kill and why you shouldn't steal and why you shouldn't do any of the negative Torah again because it's a deeper concept. The foolish one, this is going back to the Zohar, the foolish only look at the clothing, namely the stories of the Torah, and do not bother to look and to see what's behind the clothing. But those who know better do not suffice with looking at clothing alone. Rather, at the body that would lies beneath the clothing. The wise servant of an eternal king who stood on Mount Sinai looked only at the solo Torah, the main part of the Torah. That's why it says, when it wants to characterize what happened at Matan Torah, the, the Torah says, what happened at Matan Torah? They saw what was normally heard, and they heard what was normally seen. Meaning they got out of their box. After 210 years of Egypt, slavery, and everything else they went through until even coming to the to Matan Torah, they suddenly thought out of the box. They started to see, they started to actually see things that they heard. And what they heard, what they saw, it became something that was not seen anymore. It became, they tried to not to see what they saw in the physical world. They started to look a little more deeper, what they, you heard about it. And that's really what the Torah wanted, that we should think out of the box. Everything in life, when we look at it, we should see it at what it is in the physical way and what it really is maybe. Everything. That's what the Torah wanted to accomplish. That is really, in essence, I you got the answer of why the Torah wanted and put Yisrael before the giving of the Torah. Because if we cannot learn to think out of the box, when, then the Torah is not going to affect us. We're going to bring the Torah into the box. We're going to bring God into the box. We're going to limit not only ourselves, we're going to limit God. That's sad. That's not what God wanted. God wanted to come and to be revealed in a greater way so we would think out of the box. I, I, I'm confused by it, Rabbi, because there's so many sure. boundaries, so many boundaries in the Torah, you know, fences, nope. all these fences. Like, there's there's like no boxes. boundaries, no boundaries. All these fences are there for the opposite of boundaries. 
Nope. That's when you look at the Torah. Every negative thing is there not to get us out of the 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 the, 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 the out of the worldly issue. That's if you you get yourself too much into the box, which is all these boundaries. Not, I have to look at a boundary as something that is positive, not that it's something that's a boundary. Understand? I can say, you know what? I'm going to continue eating and eating and eating, but maybe if I stop eating. I'll be healthier. Stop thinking just because there's food in front of me, I can eat it. Oh, so I'm putting a boundary. I'm telling, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to start to not eating everything. I, that, that's a boundary. No, that's a, that's a good thing. Because it's what's behind that boundary. It's what's behind it. It's not the boundary. Again, you're looking at again. You're looking in the box. That's not looking at the at the at the at what's out of the the reason behind this boundary. So if you look at it as a boundary, yeah. When a child, when a parent puts boundary for children, what they're putting it because they want to they want to limit the child. Who would want to limit his child? No, they're putting it because they realize this boundary will make him a better person. If you're gonna let him do whatever he wants, he's gonna grow up to be a a chayera. So it depends the way you look at it. If I'm a child, I say, I'm screaming. Oh, I hate my parents. They're terrible people. Slam the doors. And uh, I'm angry. My mother doesn't want to let me do this. My father doesn't let me do that. That's immature. That's thinking in the box. That's thinking like a child. But I right now I want this and you're restricting it for me. If I'm an adult, I realize, wow, you know what? This boundary is a good thing. This boundary actually is going to save my life. This boundary is actually going to make me who I am. Right? So we all, Baruch Hashem, we have to we grow up. We say thank you to our parents, usually. You know, thank you for, for educating me. Thank you for, you know, disciplining me. Thank you for making me, you know, who I am. Right? Even though the time when you did it to me, I was not so happy. But you know what? As I grew older, I realized, you know what? You did it out of love. You didn't do it because you wanted to restrict me. You did it because you wanted to, you wanted to help me. Think out of the box. It's hard for us as immature children to think out of the box. But God wanted that on all of us, to think out of the box. The Abishta does not want to restrict anybody from anything. He doesn't want you actually to, 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 to enjoy the Shabbos. If you're not going to restrict on Shabbos, how are you going to do the Shabbos? How are you going to enjoy the Shabbos if, if, if Shabbos is going to be a regular Sunday, Monday, Tuesday? How are we going to be able to do it? We're not. Just because, like, just like we can't make Sunday, Monday, Tuesday into Shabbos, we would not be able to do it if we were not going to restrict ourselves from Allah on Shabbos. It's a simple concept. So the, this restriction is the most beautiful thing. That once a week, thank God I can put my phone down and not look at it, is the greatest bracha. Right? It's the greatest blessing. <laughs> Thank God I can restrict myself for once or once in a while from all this worldly, all the news and all everything else. Thank God. Right? Baruch Hashem. I can look at a restriction. I can look at it as a blessing. I got to think out of the box to look at it as a blessing. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Abishta wanted, that I should be able to look out of the box. Don't look at the restriction. Look at the reason behind it. You'll realize... This is not a restriction. Actually, this restriction is better than any positive thing. This restriction was what makes it what makes it all beautiful, right? So let's take uh, this thing in Shabbos. You, you asked me a question. You know, if I would say do the Shabbos while I'm still unrestricted, well, the Shabbos would not be there. So I'll have a I'll have a kiddush. I'll go to shul a little bit more if I'm still doing everything else. It will still it will, it won't have the taste. It won't have the feeling. It wouldn't have it. You need to stop for everything. You need to put everything aside to get the beauty of the positive mitzvahs. So the, therefore, you just take the Shabbos example. Not that I've taken away all the negative or I've done all the, not doing all the negative. Now I have the beauty of the positive. Now I can in, impress to myself the positive because I'm not doing all the negative. I have the beauty of the positive. So it all depends the way I look at everything. I think my answer to you is. And 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 again, so that's what the Torah wanted. 
The Torah wanted that I should have, actually one of the Ten Commandments is keep the Shabbos. Um, so the Torah wanted that I should be able to have a paragraph share. It was interesting, actually, the Torah was, even before the Jewish people given the Torah, they kept the Shabbos also, it's brought down. But here the Torah wanted the concept of Kedusha. The Torah wanted a person should love the Shabbos. That's a, oh, so that's, that's the beauty of Yisrael. Yisrael dropped, dropped everything, and he loved God. Yisrael, if you want to give an example of a guy who made a paragraph, he made a total change in his life, that's the guy. It's like any any convert even today. You see a convert today, a person that dropped everything in his life, changed his life. Have to say again. That's why the, that's why, I mean, the convicts that I know, they're uh, they're unbelievable. They're unbelievable. To be able to make that shift and change, that's phenomenal. Unbelievable. They're, they're like an example to, to everybody, every one of us. Of what means to, to change one's life. What means to make that change in everything that they were brought up with and everything that they were taught and they should drop the soul and change their life. What I tell you? I, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, it's, a, it's a very hard thing to see. I always tell people when I, you know, when I, I've been, when I go to the, you know, to the conversion of, of, of somebody and I hear, you know, the questions they ask, the rabbis ask the questions uh, by the mikvah, you know, and they ask, they ask the person the question, you know, do you accept upon yourself, you know, the positive, all the positive, and they say, yes, you accept the rabbinical command. I'm thinking to myself, did anybody ask me that question? Was I ever brought in front of a group of rabbis and I'm asked the question, Zalman Bukit, do you accept upon yourself all the positive commandments? Nobody asked me that question. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what my answer would be. <laughs> Maybe I, I'll say, you mean I have a choice? I can, I can. And that's the truth. They tell the person, you, you have a choice. You can say no. Nobody's forcing you here to do. You can say no, and, and, that, and that's just fine. But you, you have to accept upon yourself. Do you accept upon yourself all the positive command, all the negative command? Do you accept upon yourself to uh that's unbelievable questions? Unbelievable questions. Thank God they didn't ask me those questions. That was yesterday, my friend. Every convert that I've met, that's yesterday. That is unbelievable. That's an example to all of us. And it is, should be an example to all of us. What means to to, to, to do that. What means to be asked that question? What means to change your life? And the truth is, as I tell people in my own show, you know, when I see people accepting themselves more Yiddish guides and learning more and loving. It's a, I'm, I'm inspired. It's an inspiration to me because, because I was brought up this way. And, and I, I, you know, this is the, you know, this is the way I am. You know, I was brought up in a religious home. I was brought up in a Torah home. Or my father's a rabbi. And uh, my mother was a, a rabbit sin, and I, we were brought up this way. Thank God, you know. And most of most people that I meet in, in Boca and whoever, you know, they were not brought up this way. And their uh, their love of Torah and their love of learning and their love of Yiddishkeit is an inspiration. It is truly is. So the Rebbe. Doesn't make it, the point. I don't think of the sikh that it's very, what, what your turn is. You every person, like I said, to be here. Mash, what did you hear? What touched you? You need to continue to do that. You need to continue to connect to what touched you. Probably some people who are touched, they just then they, they, they just uh, you have to then they just go on and it becomes like a secondary kind of thing. But you have to always go back to that. What inspired you? What inspired you to make the, the shift? What inspired you to make the, 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 the turnaround? Remember that, that, that inspiration. Remember that soul. Something inspired you. you it, it couldn't be something physical. What, the chalot made you? Uh, uh, what, what do you see that inspired you? Something spiritual inspired you. Something spiritual inspires us. 
that makes us make these kind of these kind of these kind of turnabouts. And that's the beauty. That's the beauty of 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 of, of Yisrael. That's really the beautiful the beauty of this Pasha. To be able to accept upon ourselves the Torah, to be able to receive the Torah, we have to be ready to make that turnaround. We have to be ready to think a little different. Think out of the box. These people thought out of the box. And the proof is, most of you that I have met, most of their family and their friends tell me, you're a sugar. What are you doing? You're crazy. Most of the I meet, People that have come more from my show, their families or their friends say you're Meshuga. And they are Meshuga because where they came from to where they are now, they're Meshuga. They're Meshuga in a positive way. <laughs> they're crazy. They throw it out of the box. That's being crazy. That's what's called in Kabbalah, Shtus to Kedusha. There's stupidity in Klippa, in, in, in evil, and there's stupidity in holiness. Stupidity in holiness is going out of the box. And that's a positive thing, because not everything can be worked out. You can't explain what inspired you, something that turned you, turned you on, something that inspired you. It was not, it's not something physical, it's a spiritual thing, something spoke to your soul. Something you reached your hand out to. Went above your seichel, went above your, your intellect. So that's why the Rebbe brings down. So that it says, so if we go back in the Medjish, so the Rebbe brings down the Medjish in text number 14. What is the matter of analogies? What's not in Torah? The Rebbe gives an analogy. The Medjish gives an analogy. The king decreed that the, the people of Rome cannot go down to the people of Syria, and the Syrians cannot ascend. It was a decree that above cannot go below, below the, the below cannot go above. There's a boundaries. There's boundaries, the box. So too, when God created the world, he decreed that the heaven belongs to God. The earth belongs to humans. When he gave the Torah, he abolished the decree. David said, I'm breaking the box. That's what Martin Taylor is. I'm breaking the mold. You need to go higher than yourself. You can reach up to heaven. And heaven can reach, come down to you. That the below shall come below, climb above, and those above shall descend below. God says, go both ways. If you reach up to heaven, the heavens will come down to you. If you don't reach up to heaven, you'll stick in your box. You'll be stuck in your box your whole life. But if you reach up to heaven, the heavens will come down to you. I mean, I think, Rabbi, that's why um, the, the Babacher Rebbe was so beloved by people because he loved everybody. And, you know, he thought out of the box, like a lot of, a lot of sex, you know, whether it's Jewish or non-Jewish, they keep to themselves, they keep in their own little world and he was just such a, a lover of everybody what so somebody asked the question why does every chassid have a picture of the rebbe in his house so one chassid answered smartly he said when i have a, i have a mirror in my house i see myself and when i look at the rebbe i see what i could be because the rebbe always brought out what a person could be push people to be better than greater than themselves push people to think out of the box that was the rebbe did always push people to think out of the box. So he said, I have a picture because I look at it, it's a second mirror. And that second mirror tells me I can be better. I can go higher. I can lift my hands up higher. So that was <laughs> Martin Taylor. That was Martin Taylor. Martin Taylor was that we can lift me higher. We can go higher. It's higher than our space. Our space is three armors. We can lift up our hands and go higher. And if you realize, when you lift up your hands, you always feel your hands can go higher. It's a funny thing. But when you lift up your hands, you always think that you can go higher, right? You can go higher, go higher, I can reach higher. Your hands, it feels like it's like un unlimited. The truth is, that was the beauty of, uh, of your chabed, not your chabed, of Batya, who reached out her hand, and her hand went further. We see this expression in the title. Over here also, the, this expression, of Yad Moshe, the hands, because Ixidus explains that actually when a person does something, he realizes that how far he can go. It's very hard to, to realize because we, we, we're afraid to do things. 
And actually, when we start doing things, we realize how far we can go. And that's, that is resembled in the hands. That's where the hands go further. The action goes further. That's why the Rebbe would say, usually the world says, understand something and then do. I say the, the Torah says the opposite. Do, and you'll understand. The more you'll do, the more you'll understand. Because the doing brings you to places that you will never, you, you would never do if you told you'll understand it. If you're going to wait everything to do until you understand, you'll never do anything. Because your brain will limit you. will tell you, don't go there. Don't do that. So it cannot be always rational. Because the brain will say, the, like, take, take tzedakah. Take the mitzvah of tzedakah. The brain will say, why do you need tzedakah? It's my money. This is mine. Why should I keep tzedakah rationally? I help people. I'll help people. I'll go to hospitals. I'll go, I'll do, why do I need to give charity? Why do I need to do that? It's my money. And, and rationally, that makes sense. Well, I, I work for it. I, I need the money myself. So why would I go and help give my money that I worked on? I didn't steal the money. I got this money ethically and morally and legally. Why should I give it? David says, no. Give it anyway. And God says, because the more you give, the more I'll give you. So get out of the box. Stop thinking like the, the rational. Stop worrying about, you know, le you know, all your, 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 my thoughts of how I should live and how I should, what I should give and what I shouldn't. Get out of the box. Get out of the box. And you'll see the more you give, the more you'll get. You, you, you have nothing to worry about that. Actually going to realize how much more you can give. Start getting out of the box. Get out of the box. And I gave you your hands, because that's the way you're going to get out of the box. That's the way you're going to do it. So therefore, let's finish this off. I'm ready to pass my time. By Yishma Yisrael, text number 15. The Rashi says, very interesting Rashi. The Rashi says an interesting word over here. Shamo Ba. Why did Yisrael hear and he came? What does that mean? What it means Uba? It actually adds another word there, Uba, and he came. Mashmu Shama Uba. What does it actually mean with the word Uba? And he came. You know what it actually means? This is such a beautiful that Abba explains. And he says, we, can, we all hear a lot of things. We all hear wonderful things. Nobody's moving much. Nobody's changing. <laughs> We're listening, drushes and drushes and classes and classes. But what? What to ba? What about? It has to be the ba. That has to be the change. That's why you say heard a lot of things. But what made him come? What made the transact? What got him to reach out? What got him to come? We can learn and learn and see the beauty of Yiddish God and see the beauty of Torah. It's beautiful. Torah is beautiful. Great knowledge, great philosophy, great holiness. But. But what? The, the, the main word over here is Uba. And he came. What did he hear that made him come? He could have stayed in this country. He could have been a, a, a continue his life. Nobody, and he's a wonderful man. He's an ethical man. He's a moral man. He's a whatever. I've got Aiden. What made him come? That's the trick. What made it bring in, what made the yad, what made the, the, the action? That is where you know the moment he thought out of the box. And that's why Rashi says, what made him come? Shama, Rashi says he heard, splitting in the sea, and the world, he heard such unbelievable out of the box situations. Because he was a man in the box. He knew everything, how everything runs. He knew everything, how every deity works. But then he saw things that are out of the box. That moved him to get himself out of the box and to come and to come. Let's end over the text 16, the words of the devil. The entire thrust of Matan Tater is about shattering the gate, great divide between the upper and lower worlds. Namely, that the physical creatures should be able to climb out of their hurry, his or her natural limits and reach beyond it to the divine. As such, just gesture. 
personal odyssey, which as mentioned, laid the groundwork for Martin Taylor, mirrored this motion. He broke free of his personal limitations, which was an unbelievable thing. And especially at his age, he was not a young man. After all, what made Jethro actually come? What compelled Jethro, Jethro to shatter his personal limitation and join the dudes in a desolate desert? It was this idea, namely, that Jethro was impacted in a way that he knew he had actually, he had to actually come to break free of his natural. Jethro realized that he that he that to become greater than he is is he needs to be he needs to get out of his his rationalization and he needs to break that will make him even a greater person to break free from his natural to, to give up his prestige as a Cohen of Midian to come to a desolate place and convert. This laid the groundwork of Martin Taylor when God shattered the great divide between the upper and lower worlds. And therefore, the Rebbe says, that's why we have Yisrael, even though as I started the class, that Yisrael is really came after Martin Taylor. Yisrael is really not in chronological order. We, and so really doesn't belong here. But nevertheless, the Torah wanted to put my Torah in this week's portion. And the Torah wanted to give us each and every one of us a groundwork of how to receive the Torah this week. And that's by getting out of the box. Learn from Yisrael, who converted, who went away from his natural existence, go out of the box, think out of the box, and you'll be able to be able to receive the Torah in a much more powerful way. It's a beautiful sikha of the Rebbe. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have any questions you may ask, I just want to mention that on Thursday night, we are going to have starting the JLI course on this on the journey of the soul. Another powerful class, civic class on, on the journey of the Neshama. It's an amazing class. And hopefully you got the book. If you didn't get the book, Come on the class anyway. Uh, the first class, you'll be able to get a PDF. I'll be able to send you a PDF if you're not on the, our mailing list. If you're on our mailing list tonight, you should get some kind of a letter that the first class is for everybody, and they sent everybody a PDF file of the first class. I cannot do that. They don't give me the PDF for the second class. They only give it to me for the first class. So everybody can come on the first class. If you want to get the book, you can still get it because you can. You'll need it really for the second class, not. For the first class. The truth is, I wanted to say that I hate to charge uh, money for a class, but um, the, the, uh, the JLI forces me to do that. So I have no choice, and I am obligated under their rules and regulations. So I'm back to the box, which I don't. Want. So I'm still. <laughs> <laughs> this seductive box. I, uh, I signed I up. I'm very I, uh, excited. Yeah, I signed so, up and I'm so hope you signed up. But if you didn't sign up, you can still come to the first class. It's a wonderful, beautiful class. It's such a, it's a, it's Looking such a beautiful. I mean, you learn about the neshama that's totally out of the box. I hope that uh, if you didn't sign up, you will sign up, and uh, up. We'll, we'll see you all on Thursday night at seven thirty. <laughs> and uh, have yeah. a good night, everybody, and. Uh, Thank you so much, Rabbi. We'll see you Thursday. Thank you, Rabbi. Think out of the box, guy. Think out of the box. Think big. Think big. Think big. Right. God bless you all. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much.